All right. Good afternoon, everyone, Mass General Brigham folks and community partners. In honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the Stepping Strong Injury Prevention Program in partnership with the Mass General Brigham Community Cares and Engagement Team welcomes you to our virtual panel discussion on domestic violence awareness. We developed this partnership lunch and learn series to highlight the incredible work of our community partners and how critical it is to have strong partnerships with community organizations and advance community health. We cannot undertake this work without community partnerships and colleagues leading the way. We are excited to speak with incredible panelists today to talk about their important work supporting individuals who have experienced domestic violence. We encourage everyone to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to our panelists and feel free to follow up with us if you would like to connect with anyone after the discussion. This session is being recorded and will be shared with everyone soon after its conclusion. We're really excited to offer um, continuing medical education credits to physicians and nurses today. Um, if you would like to receive credit, please text the code P-A-R-L-O-D to 857-214-2277. And that information will be in the chat and we have nothing to disclose. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our moderator, Jess Loftus. Could you briefly introduce yourself and pass it away? Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Cheryl, so much. Uh, to get us started today, um, I am Jess Loftus. I use she, her pronouns. And my current title is the Clinical Program Director, supporting the work of Passageway, our in-house program, providing free, confidential, and voluntary services to survivors of intimate partner violence. I also direct our Adelante program, which is a similar model of care for survivors of sex and labor trafficking. And I've been with MGB since 2009, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this Lunch and Learn excited to start introducing our panelists today. So DV, IPV um, is a topic that touches many of us. Um, and before we, begin, before we begin, we just would like to honor um, the psychological safety of our, of our participants and audience by acknowledging that the, the topic, the discussion um, that is presented today um, might elicit feelings or activate unexpected emotions. Um, this is normal and may be expected or unexpected, um, but we encourage everyone to do what feels right for them, even if that means turning off your camera, stepping away, logging out. Um, we also have resources for those who may need additional support. You can reach out to myself individually. Um, you can also reach out to our uh, MGB's Employee Assistance Program. The EAP is also a free confidential service for everyone that is employed and household members um, of employees of our large uh, MGB system. Passageway, which is our program here at the Brigham, we work uh, in collaboration or in similar practice models to Haven, which is at MGH, as well as the domestic violence program at Newton Wellesley. Um, and there is an advocate at Salem North Shore. So our, um, our in-house support is covers the large system. And we can all connect you to local programs in your community of origin. Um, so if you need information about uh, a resource that is closer to home, uh, that's information that we have and we're happy to share. So we are all here for you and with you. So to get us started, we're just going to do a quick round of introductions. First, I'd like to introduce Paige Clark, the Director of Com uh, Community at Stonehouse. Paige, could you briefly introduce yourself and the Stonehouse, noting where Stonehouse is, uh, its mission, and the people you all serve? Thanks so much. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, my name is again Paige Clark. I have been involved with supporting families that have experienced domestic violence and intimate partner violence for about 21 years now. I work at the Stonehouse. We used to be known as Elizabeth Stonehouse. So if you know us, that, that is us. But we're currently Stonehouse and we're located in the Roxbury area. And our mission is that we work directly with survivors of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. But overall, we're supporting families that have experienced trauma due and related to. Um, so we are an agency that is uh, resource driven. So I'll start there. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. We're so thrilled that Stonehouse can join us here today. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lauren Carabas, who is the manager of violence recovery programs at Fenway Health. Lauren, could you briefly introduce yourself and Fenway Health's violence recovery program, noting where Fenway Health is located, its mission and the patients you typically serve? Sure. Um, thanks, Jess, and thanks everybody for having me. 
Um, I'm Lauren, as Jess said, um, the manager of the violence recovery program at Fenway Health. I don't have my, I don't know why my pronouns aren't showing up, but I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I've been with Fenway going on my sixth year now um, and been doing domestic violence work since the beginning of my social work career. Um, so we, our primary focus is working with the LGBTQ community, queer and trans community, um, kind of however folks identify that, specifically with survivors. We work with survivors of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, as well as sexual violence and folks who've experienced anti-LGBTQ hate violence. Sometimes those forms of violence overlap. Um, sometimes that we're seeing folks kind of individually in those siloed spaces. We were a program within Fenway Community Health, which is a community health center that primarily serves LGBTQ folks in the community. Um, we are Boston based, but we also have locations statewide. So we have an advocate out on the Cape. We've got somebody in Southeast Mass, as well as somebody out in Western Mass. So um, we do consider our services statewide, even though the bulk of our services are in Boston. Thank you so much, Lauren. We're excited that Fenway can be here with uh, be with us here today. Um, I'd like now to introduce Karu Peet, who is the executive director of Harbor Cove. I'm oh, sorry, the train just went by. Karu, could you briefly introduce yourself and Harbor Cove, um, your mission and your program? Thank you so much. Oh, you're still muted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jessica. My name is Kurupej. I am an executive director at Haboko. My pronoun is she, her, they, them. And um, so Haboko founded in 1998, um, provide, we provide safe, um, free, safe and support services along with housing and economic opportunity to promote long-term stability for, for survivors. Uh, of domestic violence. And we are specialized in serving survivors who face um, additional barriers such as language, culture, economic, um, by working to create um, connection to the support that survivor may need to rebuild their life through a continuum of options. Um, we also looking at the um, domestic violence um, that is not happening um, in a vacuum. It is connected with all forms of oppressions, um, you know, including racism, classism, sexism, anti-immigration, violence, etc. Uh, catchment area are Chelsea, Revere, Winthrop, East Boston, and Charlestown. Our staff speak 12 languages, 12 different languages. Um, we provide 24-hour crisis hotline case management for individuals and families. Um, we have emergency, transitional, and permanent housing with supportive services as well. Um, we have legal advocacy resources, including um, immigration support for survivors. We have economic development and community awareness and public education. Thank you, Thank you Peru. We're so honored that Harbor Cove can be with us today. And lastly, we're excited Shakira's story can be with us today and want to open the floor for Shakira Robinson, founder and executive director of Shakira's Story DV Consulting and Coaching to share more about her and her organization. Hi everyone, um, my name is Shakira Robinson. Um, I am the executive director um, and also the founder of Shakira's Story. Uh, we are a grassroots organization who is committed to disrupting the cycle of intimate partner violence in black and brown communities by connecting survivors and their families with immediate and long-term support to prevent a re-victimization. We are a BIPOC-led uh, organization that prides itself on our ability to offer culturally appropriate services and programming all of our service providers have lived experience and identify as secondary survivors of intimate partner violence or um, substance abuse, uh, substance use disorder. Although we receive referrals from local and state entities throughout the state of Massachusetts, we primarily service participants located in Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, and High Park. Thank you for having us. Well, so great you're here. Thank you, Shakira. Um, I'm really grateful for your presence. 
So before diving into the questions for panelists today, we'd like to just do some framing um, and share the importance of language. We know that words are powerful, language is powerful. So we wanted to just open the discussion um, by diving a little bit into um, the words that we use um, and opening it up to our panelists. Can you just comment and provide your thoughts on the difference between the phrase domestic violence and intimate partner violence? Do we have anyone that's interested in is paid? Do you have some? I, I, I don't mind with this one. Um, I mean, this term domestic violence has been around forever. I'm sure as my all of my panelists uh, and colleagues on this call know, uh, but there is a, a, a differentiation, and one is is that domestic violence is within the context of family. So this is something that can happen between a mother and a child, a father and a child, um, a siblings. This can happen with also even roommates. So considering that this is within internally, sometimes within the home and usually a familial context. Um, when we get into the aspect of intimate partner violence, we're looking at the interpersonal relationships, romantic um, friendships even, where it can there are very unhealthy kind of dynamics and relationships that go on within that. And so the latest and newest term is IPVDV um, and getting the movement to move along with that. And in that respective time is taking some time, but that is some different distinctions. So going from one that is acknowledges the family aspect, which is domestic violence, and then the intimate partner violence, which looks at real romantic um, or, you know, very strong interpersonal relationships that have those those pieces connected. And I welcome anybody else if I left anything out. Paige, thank, thank you, so Paige. Much. I think you captured it all. And then for us also, we're looking at, um, so like there are different type of intimate partners, um, violent as such as domestic violence as abuse. And we're looking at family member and also, a member of unmarried couple as well. Any other thoughts that folks want to add? If I can just add the historical context of what domestic violence looks like in black and brown communities, um, talking about like how it's responded to in terms of how we are identified as victims of domestic violence or even survivors or impacted vicariously um, through domestic violence. It has always been known that, you know, it, it only what happens at home stays at home in some cultures. But the reality of it is that it spews out into our schools and our communities. And then we have this spiraling effect of impacts or adverse experiences as we call them. And at the end of the day, if we don't talk about those things in the work that we do today, we will continue to re reinvent the cycle that's already been happening. And we're not coming at it from a culturally competent uh, perspective where we're looking at the reality of what it looks like today. There are so many different works out there and kudos to us all. But if we can't get on a page where we have some commonality in terms of how we address it as a collective, we will continue to lose people in the cycle of violence. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, those are all really powerful thoughts and important um, framing around not only semantics, but the philosophy of what does it mean for us to talk about the dynamics of violence and abuse, coercive control, um, and where does it reside in these different um, spheres within our homes, within our relationships, within our communities. Um, and there's, there's so much reverberation. Um, Shakira, you're so strong. You're like, yeah, I really thank you for bringing that that perspective and that important information. Um, and so so now that we have sort of some framing, and I just want to make sure, Lauren, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, I can make it quick. I think and I think in terms of language, it's helpful to think about the word violence also and how that can in many ways, I think we're expanding what the way that we think about what violence is, but oftentimes that can actually feel um, not accurate for the way that survivors identify um, if there hasn't been physical violence. So we often say domestic violence and intimate partner violence, but we're talking about a lot of different forms of abuse that can take place that often are primarily psychological, emotional, financial isolation. So I think all of that feels like a part of the of the language 
piece. That's it. Really important addition. Thank you. Um, language is powerful and it also is really meaningful. Um, so thinking about this sort of foundation and um, how we're, we're framing these issues, um, let's kind of move into the rest of our panel today. So um, the first part is just for an overview. The first part of our conversation will focus on um, the core work of each of the organizations. Um, and then we'll move into a conversation around sustainability, self-care, what does it mean to do this work um, in uh, over time and remain invested and present. Um, and we'll end by focusing on ways uh, for us all to support the important, incredible work that our panelists are doing and how we all can have um, a real impact together. So as Cheryl mentioned at the beginning, if anyone has questions during the conversation, please use the Q&A. Um, it's the button at the bottom of your screen to ask. Um, we want this to be as conversational as possible. It's not a long time to fit in a lot of information, but um, we are gonna do our best to keep it moving. So just to start us off, um, I'm going to uh, ask each one of you to talk about how your organizations support the um, strengths of individuals and advocate for our clients who are impacted by um, different forms of abuse, domestic violence, IPV, as we just spoke about. So Paige, why don't we start with you? You never get the mouse to move just as fast as you want to. Uh, but yes, uh, like I said, uh, Stonehouse is located in legitimately in the heart of Roxbury. We're in the, the Eggleston area. And we are a, a resource driven organization. Um, so we have a number of programs that support with housing, um, rapid rehousing, things that keep people housed. Uh, all the way to mental health counseling. And most recently we opened up a an early, an EEC certified early education center, um, specifically uh, driven towards, again, prevention, which I know we will talk about uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but what's interesting about the work that we do at Stonehouse is that we know much of the work is done through collaboration and relationship building. It is one thing for somebody to come in and say, I have domestic violence, which is great for that particular, I have experienced violence in my life, I have experienced abuse, but really majority of the time we work with a number of survivors that say, I don't know why I'm here. Um, and so much of this has to happen through conversation and also with what's happening also in real life. We have lost a resource in that family because when you're talking about individuals that are um, individuals that may create harm uh, and also respectively may have the, the bulk of the income or the resources, we need to support that as well. So while this part is getting done, we're also taking that opportunity to kind of build much more relationship through dialogue, through what are the services that we offer? What might you be interested in as an individual moving forward and moving out? So looking at the big picture of what the goals of each particular client might be, but also looking at it through, we need to model through healthy relationships, healthy, healthy collaborative exchanges, even when they're difficult, uh, so that they know you're not walking away. We're coming right back, even if we're not seeing eye to eye. So just kind of moving through those different pieces and understanding that think times are tough. Um, and so we do have to have an immediate response. And then there are times when we have to say, well, where can we meet at in the middle? So again, welcoming choice back into what are the services that we offer and what might be good. So things around that. So again, very resource driven and a number of programs because we do we find that as survivors move along in the process, it's bifurcated. So you might be at one place, one agency. So we try to condense as much as possible to be in one place at one time so that they can get the most of what they need. Thank you, Paige. Sure. So, so much work. It's hard to synthesize it all into a couple minutes. Um, Crew, do you want to uh, take that next and talk about um, all the incre incredible work that Harbor Cove does? Thank you. Um, so Harbor Cove are uh, located on the north of Tobin Bridge. Um, I would say 60% of survival will be Sewa immigrants. And um, as we know, domestic violence, intimate partner violence affects all of us and it affects BIPOC community differently because of um, this 
structure of, of violence and oppressions. Um, so we are a survivor informed and survivor driven organization. And we are not just working and can, we're not just working with individual survivor, we were also working with the community and, and service provider as well to change the system. We're looking, we're working toward economic and social justice framework. Um, because so many systems that are in place to support, but also um, oppress survivor as well. How do we work together to remove, remove those barrier and creating access? And um, one of the thing that Habaco is known for is providing, we call it a continuum housing. So starting from emergency housing um, to transitional and, and permanent housing. Right now we have uh, housing for survivor domestic violence, and then we have um, specific housing for immigrant survivor who are um, working toward their um, permanent status. And we just, you know, leave those apartments specifically for for a particular survivor, and then also um, LGBTQ survivor as well, because we know that many of whom have faced additional barriers. Um, and we are also a huge collaboration partners. We we love collaboration um, with with the community. We cannot do this work by yourself. Um, we, we, we need everybody to be, to be part of, of, of this work. We need the neighbor, we need friends, we need police, we need court, we need everybody um, to be part of this. Because like we, we said that um, domestic violence is not just happen in a vacuum, right? And also um, we have specific program that support um, immigrant survivor. We are um, accredited by the Department of Justice to provide immigration support for survivor who can access a T visa, U visa, and um, VAVA spousal petition. And we do it in in-house. We do it in-house. Um, we have a couple of our um, advocates get accredited to um, gather information um, and to work closely, closely with, the, with the survivors. Um, that has been great. And the success rate for that outcome for that is 100% um, successful. So we, we are so proud um, to be part, to partner with survivor um, with their journey. And, and um, we're looking at housing, stability, economic stability, and civic participation with, uh, for survivor, because as we know that survivor who experiencing domestic violence, isolation is a huge factor for survivor to get survivor reconnected with their peers and also, also get back in the community to build that support system is crucial. Thank you. So again, so, so much like collapsing it all and synthesizing it is like really remarkable. Shakira, can you talk a little bit about um, how you support the strengths of individuals and really advocate on behalf of or in, in accompaniment with folks? Of course, of course. Of course. Um, first and foremost, we are um, uh, victim uh, driven. Our, our en entire infrastructure is built on survivors um, also aggressors or those who identify as being aggressors of domestic violence behaviors. Um, we are also grounded in our commitment to the community. As my sister has just said, we cannot do this work alone. And so there's so much to us, but um, if I can, we recognize the importance of whole person care and have developed a service model that meets survivors and their families where they are in their survivorship and the recovery process. Um, unlike most intimate partner violence services, we provide support for survivors 
perpetrators and their dependents. Uh, such, such services are particularly critical in both adult survivorship and adolescent uh, uh, cases because there's huge differences between the two. Um, adult survivors are often more reluctant to leave the relationship, thus for working with us uh, and working with both survivor and perpetrators help to prevent re-victimization in these cases. Uh, in cases where the survivor and the perpetrator are teenagers and or identify as LGBTQIA, the act of leaving is the most dangerous point of intimate partner violence experiences. Um, this particular group also has disproportionately higher rates of suicide and substance use, which often necessitates um, the services that we provide for all parties. And so again, we are driven uh, and backed by those in our community we have a huge support uh, system in terms of our elected officials who recognize our works from a grassroots level. We are the community. Our work is committed into connecting with CBOs who may not come are coming from a lens of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. But we understand the intersectionalities between uh, suicide prevention or working with our young people for the prevention and education piece of it, because that's a huge part of what we do in terms of educating communities and individuals. We are the back bone to supporting those who are finding their voices or amplifying their voices. Uh, and we, we welcome anyone to stand beside us. Um, we're also great on partnering with others. So we look forward to doing that with the panelists here today. And so that, that's who we are. That's who we are. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. Absolutely. It's an important distinction. Um, providing services and care for everyone who is impacted and really noticing that we we do bifurcate and we've created this binary of victim perpetrator and you know we all contain multitudes right and this is when we're talking about structural racism and we're talking about these broad real like um systematic structural ways in which these dynamics are both replicated and impactful um we we can't ignore anyone so appreciate so much all that you've just spoken to. Um, and Lauren, do you wanna um, bring us home with talking about Fenway and the work that, the important work that you all do? Yeah, um, also just feeling really energized hearing you all speak right now. It's, yeah, it's like lifting me up a lot um, and resonating a lot. So yeah, I guess I'll think, I'll speak a little bit on, um, so working with LGBTQ survivors, I think in terms of thinking about strengths, I really liked what Shakira said around like whole person care and thinking about sitting with folks and what it can, you know, we hear these statistics of like, you know, black and brown trans women are the most at risk. And then, you know, sitting in that identity can feel like, oh, I'm just a statistic, or there's a lot of internalization that can happen in terms of like, oh, I've failed. What did I do wrong to get here? You know, so much of intimate partner violence is, um, can really imbue like these feelings of self-blame and self-judgment. How did I get here? And I think when, so I guess in terms of thinking about like strengths-based work or working with survivors and their strengths, it it feels like really expanding, uh, allowing people the space to experience themselves not just as a statistic or or just as a survivor, but like I'm a whole person, I'm a creative person, I'm you know I'm I'm a funny person, I have joy, I have all of these other pieces to who I am, um, and sometimes I feel like our role is like supporting people and reconnecting with themselves. And also identifying that oftentimes the choices they've made and the decisions that they made in a relationship were really strong decisions that were about their safety, about their protection. They were really smart, intelligent decisions that they were making and navigating um, a relationship, an abusive relationship, a violent relationship. So sometimes we're doing a lot of reframing for folks. Um, when they're coming in with some of those those beliefs. Um, so that's just a piece that I'll add that I'll add to the conversation. Yeah, thank you. You know, we've had a question in the chat um, about identity and sort of about um, gender expansiveness and thinking through um, what is 
how do our programs and how do your programs um, integrate both reflective care so that we have staff and folks that are of all genders that are providing care um, and, and the importance of having staff um, with multiple identities where there is um, really, there's that shared um, connection, maybe more ease um, to building some trust and alliance. Um, so I, I would love to um, have you comment on how your, your work integrates some of uh, more expansive ideas around having, um, for example, um, men, cis men in your work. Um, and yeah, that was a, that's a question that's been raised. So maybe Lauren will go in the opposite direction, start with you. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And I think that, I think that it's, I, yeah, I think that it's like without question that for the majority of the time sharing an identity with the person, the provider that you're working with, the person that you're allied with, um, just can feel like a really affirming experience, especially I think when we think about historically services not being by and for the communities that we're serving. Um, a lot of white women have been right in place serving um, black and brown survivors historically. And that I think so I think it's not just about identity, but it's about like which identities. Um, and then I think about, so I know as a queer person sitting across from folks that are also queer, like there's that, there's like that breath. There's just like a deeper breath that I notice, um, that I notice in working with folks who have different identities than me. Sometimes I can feel the tension. Um, so I think, something that feels important, I guess, for me is like not dancing around that, not pretending like that's not there, not pretending that somebody might not be as at ease with me um, as their support. And how can we talk about that? And how can we also like build community, um, build connection um, so that it doesn't feel like a further isolating experience to be working with someone who doesn't have a shared identity? I hope that makes sense. That makes, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Shakira, do you have any thoughts? In terms of how we show up um, uh, with Shakira's story in disrupting uh, the cycle of domestic violence and intimate partner violence, we were very, very intentional in terms of what our team looks like and, and also um, who we partner with in terms of the work. And so we understand again that black and brown women have historically been the uh, main population who are impacted by domestic violence. And so therefore black and brown boys and men will be on the opposite side in terms of the aggressors. Um, but let's also clarify that men are also victims of domestic violence. And in particular, LGBTQIA men and women, our trans brothers and sisters, those uh, populations are not subpopulations. Like we said earlier, they are whole humans. And so therefore their uh, experiences is wrapped in that phenomena of what domestic violence is, which is nothing but experiences, behaviors, and attitudes. Attitudes. And so when we look at it from that perspective, then we can welcome in those individuals to the conversation to, to allow them to amplify their voices and experiences because without their stories, we are really working in circles because we're not really looking at the whole picture. And so with that, we partner with a lot of uh, black male led organizations that work intimately with young boys uh, and the same thing goes for our black and brown girls. Um, but we are also actively seeking an active relationship with the Asian Women's Task Force for Domestic Violence and also the Haitian Women's Association because it's bigger than us and we will not get tired of saying that. And so in terms of a male-led perspective, we do have Donald Osgood on our team um, who has been active in the city of Boston forever and a day um, and his voice and impact is effective. We have Daniel Bateson, who was an attorney um, who is very, very passionate about juvenile justice. And so again, we talk about our young people in this cycle of violence. We need to make sure that they're educated on the choices they're making in terms of the relationships that they are entering and staying in, and then the choices that they make in terms of how they exit. Um, and so we, we, we know that without talking to both sides of the conversation, again, we will just be doing this work in circles. 
Right, right. I think that there's probably a lot of head nods and snaps that are happening in the um, participants here. Uh, Karu, what are your thoughts? I also echo Sister Shakira as well. Have a cool team. I would say 90% of our staff are BIPOC um, staff. Um, and it's not happening um, coincidentally. <laughs> incidentally, um, it's it's consciously um, responding to the community we serve. And it is important to have um, someone that survivor can identify with, either culturally, um, sexuality, or language. It, it's very, very important. And the thing that we also do that when we collaborate with the community organization, we're looking at the strength in that community. We're not going to go and force our work within that community. The last thing we want to do is to colonize another community. So um, it's important for us to, even with funder who said, you should provide such and such number of survivor that you work with in order to receive this funding. We said, no, our first initiative is to learn about that community what the strengths are and what, how can we partner? How can we be, can we be supportive to, to the survivors? So we're looking at the strength of each community that we are collaboration, collaborate with or, or working with. And the same for the survivor, we're looking at the strength and, and res resiliencies and survivor know best. They know what, um, is working for, for them, what's, and I don't even like to use the word survivor and the, us and them because we can be part of the survivor as well, right? Um, I don't want to separate that um, as well. So survivor know best and we, we, we work with survivor where they act. Um, and the other piece I also want to address is, is so important that when you build an organization in a community of color, you, you need to look at the staff um, representation. It is important because if I'm working, if I'm a, an Asian survivor, I don't have to repeat my story. I don't have to explain my culture. Somebody can fully understand me, right? I don't have to explain the language, the structure of my community. So um, that, that is important. And then also just be aware, sometimes the community is really small. You might go outside of that community and working with someone else as well. So um, it's not just one size fit all, right? Um, you're gonna have to look at a comprehensive approach and wrap around approach for each survivors. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, crew. And Paige, can you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that there is anything that wasn't uh, acknowledged and said with 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 my panelists and my peers. I it's fascinating because when we're thinking about our our teams and our staff that we have the we have the opportunity of working with, but we also know that there are services and deliveries that have to happen. Is that we have a I often think that I have a responsibility and I know I do to break down and acknowledge often the systemic challenges of all of the identities. So that is fine that somebody comes in and identifies as experiencing domestic violence actively in a domestic violence situation, relationship, IP, all of the above. But then what happens when that person starts to build relationship and we find a new identity that they are a, a queer woman of color. And when they sit across from Paige and they go, and I go, absolutely, can completely relate. And how does that best relate to that particular client? Am I doing it as a way to pat Paige on the back or am I doing it in a way that says, I can trust in Stonehouse because it reflects my other community. It reflects other pieces of me and they get it. And I won't have to overextend the bifurcation I have to do with my identities. So that's a big thing when working with our staff is to say, we can't be afraid to acknowledge the identities, whether they are men that are coming in, 
cis men, whether they are queer identifying along the spectrum or again, our trans uh, black and brown women, we have to be okay with showing up. And if we can't show up, what do you need from me to help break down that barrier? So also acknowledging organizationally what's so important to do to tap into those other identities. And then also saying, this is when we have it. I need to talk to Karu and reaching out to that other level of support. Yeah, thank you. Um, I hear so many themes of just like real humility and connection and um, naming, right? Like being honest and transparent around identities, about um, where sort of scope and limitations lie, um, and also being really um, that connected to values of um, wanting to be with with folks and um, not offer or promise something that is um, not a deliverable, right? So it really leads me to thinking about connections and thinking, of, thinking about um, reflections of community um, and shared identities. Can we talk a little bit about what the work looks like um, in the prevention realm? And how do we how do we come to the work from a place where we're not um, responding to folks that are walking in the door after things have happened? Um, so I'd love to hear what how you all think about prevention and and what your your work is in in that sphere. Um, we want to start. Does anyone feel really compelled to to jump in? I I think it's this is a huge part of who we are at Shakira's story. We do a lot of education around what domestic violence and intimate partner uh, violence looks like. And so we do a lot of workshops in terms of healthy relationships and how uh, DV uh, interrelates with suicide prevention and how it interrelates with mental health, how it interrelates with substance use disorders, how it interrelates with homelessness, uh, you name it. And so um, that's a huge part of what we do because if again, if we don't have the information that we need to make sound decisions, then we will continue to remain at a level of uh, ignorance in terms of the systems that we are seeking because we're not cognizant of the people that are reaching out to us in terms of the support that they need. Because like Paige said earlier, sometimes they don't know what they need. And so we need to hear, actively listen and be able to help folks navigate them through systems in terms of breaking it down into layman's terms sometimes, in terms of really pulling out what the resources look like in their community. And if I can be honest in terms of being able to have those hard conversations when folks are saying, so I've turned to this many organizations and no one's helped me until now. Uh, and being able to hear uh, their concerns and their, their um, objections to the services that we're saying these people are here to help you and being able to listen in two ways. One, where we're really listening to what the victim or survivor is saying in terms of what they need. And then also being able to hear what the system that we're servicing needs because the DV system in the state of Massachusetts needs some immediate work and it's gonna take all of us. And so um, we are big on education, but we're also huge on backing those who are actively ready to pursue their case because we have to stop telling people just call 911 do these steps right here and you're done you're good that's there's no such thing this is a huge huge step that they're taking that has many layers and so there's going to be wins and there's going to be losses and so folks need to be prepared for those hard no's or for when uh, organizations or entities are saying so no you're not you're it's not that bad for you and so you don't qualify unfortunately for black and brown communities we have not qualified for services for far too long. Um, in terms of supporting uh, those who are impacted by homelessness, there's not enough beds in the state of Massachusetts. And so educating people properly who have been misinformed on going in a restraining order, girl, you're going to get on the waiting list, you're going to get a Section 8 tomorrow. That is not true. And so we're, we're, we're working and we're doing this work, but we're also debunking myths that people have been living in survivorship their whole lives. It's been passed down from grandma to auntie, and this is what we know in terms of how to respond to a system. And so if we educate on the differences between these systems and really let people know that sometimes they work and sometimes they don't we have to be honest because if we're not we're going to keep sending people through doors and they're going to keep getting the doors slammed in their faces or we're going to have unfortunate circumstances where we're going to be too late thank you shakira like <laughs> absolutely i um 
And I, I, I jump in right where you are because we, I've always, from my perspective, and it's as an individual in working with uh, Stonehouse and doing the, being the director of all the programs is that for, for, for us, it's our, our childhood, early childhood education program. And finally acknowledging we like to see our, our clients as families or individuals, the whole person, the whole family. Like when we're doing an intake, the intake is about what, who else is in the family? Okay, so we have a two-year-old, we have a four-year-old. So we, it was very purposeful that we implemented an early education um, facet to our, to our programming. And so we are EEC certified, but what's different is, is that we've decided Instead of a child that is exerting very large feelings and emotions uh, in very small bodies with probably limited uh, language and all the above, instead of us kind of like dinging them and giving them a warning, how about we get on the floor, eye contact, and get down and dirty? How do we move a class out? How do we actually put in gross motor support to support moving trauma out of the body and coping strategy. So we can have curriculum that is absolutely tested and quantified and all the above, but then let's also slide in some things that are going to actually stop the cradles to prison pipeline. So that's the other thing about intervention is the cradles to prison. I know they do this, the school to prison. No, I see it as that's also, if you have a child that has moved from three different daycares before the age of five, and you think that this will not follow them into the elementary school, shame on us. So that is a very purposeful and intentional piece that we have done to make sure that we are addressing and not just addressing the fact that they have these behaviors, but helping families go, you can go downstairs and start working with a case manager to start looking at no matter how many times they say no, but you guys have just stuck beside me. You're not mad at this child. You're not kicking us out. You're not even report like there we there are some cases that are, again, beyond us, which we have seen um, and need to take the right the right steps for. But in the end, I think it really often in, in my world I see is with the, the, the little people that have huge emotions and small bodies and they just need a place to put it and wear that spot um, to kind of start working through. What are you feeling? How is it sitting in your body? What do we need to do to move through it so that you're not caught early on in the first grade and identified as either needing to be on medications or that you're core evaluated for just post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's a completely wrong, I would say. And I also, I, I'm an LMHC, so I, I speak to this in, in, a, in a number of contexts, but just understanding that complex PTSD is also sitting in our children. And so that's the perspective that I often come in from is from a family piece of that. If we can get the whole family involved and believe in at least one aspect of the program, then we're doing those pieces of prevention. Yeah, beautifully said that prevention is you know, it should be this natural sort of place that we all come from to create the conditions for each person to feel cared for and loved and seen and have their needs met and have stability. And, um, and so how do we create that for everyone that does feel like just such a simplistic but fundamental um, piece that you're all speaking to? Anything you want to add, Karu or Lauren? Um, Yes, we, the work that we're doing at Habaco, I think intervention and prevention has to go hand in hand because what we are doing, we become experts in supporting survivor, but we're not um, looking at the root causes of violence, um, domestic violence. Like why do we have so many survivor domestic violence that we become experts in responding? Um, so looking at the system of oppression, racism, and all kinds of ism, it's important for our work. Um, especially, so we work with survivor of domestic violence, but what we're going to do with the, um, the people who's doing harm, right? They are part of our community. You can't just say, hey, pro move them from Chelsea to um, Everett. And then, um, right? So um, 
So the work need to shift. And for, for Habuco, we're looking at a whole wrap around support for survivor. We're working in collaboration with the school. Um, doing, so a few years ago, just you know, to share a little bit. Um, a few years ago, we uh, Habuco take on the um, circle practice that is gifted by an indigenous um, community to create, um, to use it as a form of governance and community building, restorative justice, um, transformative justice. So we've been implementing the circle um, with survivor, with the community to promote, um, like Sister Shakira said, difficult conversation, to have difficult heart to heart conversation um, about how do we overcome domestic violence? Um, how do we stop and interrupt the cycle of violence? And what kind of education do we need? What kind of conversation do we need to have with young people and with adults, with elderly? So it's, it's a multi-pronged um, approach. Um, so a, a few years ago, we know that the majority of the survivor who's been harmed, harmed by the abuser are male. And um, what we we did that Habakov um, kind of lines, we call it men in leadership, which is men who hold lots of power um, in decision making. And how can we embrace them? How can we involve all the men be part of this journey in interrupting and, and um, overcoming the, the violence um, and domestic violence in the future, now and in the future. So I said, you know, if we keep on responding to harm and not stopping the harm, we're gonna do that for many, many more years, right? So things need to change. So we um, get together with police chief, fire chief, um, principal, superintendent, we had a um, circle process with them. We call men in leadership um, circle. I have to say, everybody joined that circle. And we are, look, we are not looking at good men, bad men. We're looking at socialization of manhood. How can a small majority of people who's doing harm are supported by the whole structure, right, of manhood. And we're looking at self-reflection working toward institutional change. How can you um, interrupt the behavior that is abusive? How can you be a good upstander, right, to have those conversations? I have to say, when we invited 32 men in leadership in power position to come, 38 show up and um, and they very dedicated to time and and the work that they put into that circle. We have like two hours every two months coming together, including city mayor, um, city manager. And um, we paw because of the pandemic, we're gonna pick it up again. It's a very, um, thoughtful conversation in a circle. And it, it, it promotes equity. And also um, it's, it's important to involve the community. I address it again and again. Involving community to doing this work is, is so important. Responding to harm that has been done and then stopping the harm to begin with, it, it's so important for our work. So critical. Yeah, that's an amazing um, experience to share and really reflect on the incredible work that you all are doing. Um, it really brings it all together. There are a couple I'm aware of time, so we are we're winding down. And before we close, I just want to um, and we can open it up to hopefully a couple of questions that are in the chat. Um, 
and you all can respond. I just wanna shout out a reminder to folks, um, if you're an MGB Brigham staff um, and you have any questions or concerns, you wanna to talk to someone about the issues that have been raised, um, EAP is available for you, Passageway is available, again, local programs, um, and we're all here to um, support and care for you. Um, so a couple of the questions and comments that we found in, um, in the chat that have been elicited by this um, really, really, um, just powerful conversation. Um, Ruth Zacharin, thanks for being here. She um, she mentioned, you know, that the tie-in um, and thinking about the conversation um, has to include uh, firearms and guns and gun violence. And so, um, really knowing that there is such intersection and we know about um, lethality when there's domestic violence and there's firearms present. Um, and so it's so deeply connected. Um, if folks have any comments on that, um, definitely welcome them. It looks like Paige, you wanna jump into that and respond. I do, and I wanna be quick. I know we're short on time, but I, I was so ex excited to see this. So thank you, Ruth, for putting it in. Um, Stonehouse has, I, with being an urban led organization first and foremost and being in Roxbury and all of the displays that we see in media of how Roxbury so it, it for so many so many I get asked like am I in danger no I walk out of my home very comfortably and with ease but we have a community response at Stonehouse um, which I'm very proud of and at times it can make people very uncomfortable at the same time because we do not see the the forms of gun violence um, and community harm as separate from intimate partner violence or domestic violence. It is not. We see them very intersectionally connected, which means we have an active, as a community-led organization, um, as a survivor-driven organization, we have an active duty to not negate that or disregard it. We have to address it. We have to get involved It no matter how we figure it out. And it's complicated um, and it's layers. But it's one that we're driven in. Um, I work very closely with a, uh, a number of people. I don't know who knows, but Sean Peters on this call. He works very closely with me on this. Um, the city of Boston, things are like that. So seeing great initiatives happen, but really knowing the partners that are on the ground doing it. Um, so just knowing that we are also a part of that world as well, that it is not isolated and siloed. We are here to work with all that are experiencing these pieces. So just wanted to put that in. Absolutely, Rasan is absolutely here. He's asked a number of important questions. Um, so good shout out to him. And Shakira, what are your thoughts? I just wanted to say, uh, Ruth Zacharin is a great friend of mine and uh, colleague. She is with the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence mm -hmm. and Domestic Violence. Uh, there's so many cases, the statistics and numbers in terms of how often a gun is involved in domestic violence cases are skyrocketing. And we're seeing mm -hmm. it right now in our community. Um, in terms of what Paige said, in terms of supporting those who are doing the work in prevention with gun violence, I highly recommend that you look into becoming a member of the Mass Coalition to prevent gun violence as we did, um, because all of our work is interconnected. And so nice. again, I, I wanna end with, if we support one another and we stand strong together, then all of this conversation that we're having will be forward thinking, but will also be actionable. Our people can see it, we can see real results. When we talk about quantitative data, this is it. And so we can't just talk about it, we, got, we have to do something now. And so I just wanted to put it out there that Ruth is here um, and I highly recommend that you guys reach out to her in terms of how can you become a member and what can you do to support the work that they do? Because if we can't see it now and you didn't see it over the last two weeks, it is needed and it's necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, doing that. Um, oh, go ahead, Karu. Thank you, Ruth, for all your advocacy work to stop the gun violence. As we all know, that um, the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the homicide by five hundred percent. So it's huge, and it's it's so important to be part of of the the movement to stop gun violence. And it's like all my sister had said that it's an interconnection. It's it's not just an isolation um, issue. That's right. So just to kind of wrap us up, I am gonna ask each one of you to offer like one or two words about um, how you think about sustaining yourself in the work. What are the things that keep you here, keep you grounded? So Lauren, let's start with you. 
I think normalizing that it's okay to be impacted by this work. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're necessarily burnt out or not cut out for it, but that the impact is okay. Love that. Shakira, how about you? Um, um, I, you probably should have saved me for last with this one, but um, I would be remiss and excuse me if I don't mention uh, Jimmy Imadri, Sherelle Pringle, Deja Jenkin Minus. Um, those are three that have hit home to me. Um, very intimate, very personal. And, and showing up and doing this work, we are responding to those we love. We are responding to those that we've grown up with in community. Uh, Jimia was murdered this month, three years ago, and we are still waiting for justice. Um, so I wanna make sure that in this moment, we are bringing them into this room and we're leaving this conversation knowing that their lives mattered. They will hold people and their families are still seeking justice. Um, also wanted to say that um, in terms of what we do, in terms of being active, uh, workers in this work, I am also a survivor. And so every time we answer to a call, this is personal. Um, it is personal for me, but it's also spiritual because it is bigger than me. Um, my fight is her fight and his fight. And so therefore we are committed to the work that it takes to prevent further harm. Um, we can't talk about harm reduction with look, without looking at the fact that some of us who are in service are perpetuating harm. And so I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thank you. I think for us, it's so important to do healing work within ourselves. At some point, we are all a survivor. We're working with survivor of domestic violence. We are all a survivor as well. And it's, it's important for organization, for individual to um, integrate self-care on a regular basis and healing is, is so important for all of us and to figure it out what the healing modalities are for all of us is, is crucial. Because I, I cannot be present if I'm not healed and I'm, I'm not well. And um, so therefore I have a commitment, staff have a commitment to do our own healing and, and creating environment and space that each individual can do that. And as an individual or as a team. I like that and thank you all. Um, this is really powerful, it's very overdue and needed. Uh, but I would like to say that healing is an, is an everyday act action um, an intentional um, piece of my life. Uh, it's an intentional piece of the work. And the work chose me and I choose to come back to it every single day. It chose me 21 years ago and I would say it chose me even earlier um, as, a, as a young survivor and having my own personal story um, in the world of being a survivor as well. And it's very, it's very important that every few months I have to kind of sit and do a self inventory of which identity needs that level of healing, which identity is it the survivor or am I back in victim, or is it actually just the program director that is exhausted and honoring all of those pieces and, and being okay with that and then also leaving space for our staff and colleagues to have that space having that open door policy, um, knowing that it's okay people fight and push so much, but it's all right if they say, I need a few days off. And not fighting that, take the time. We need to regroup, we need rest. We need all of the things, all of the things that bring us joy, all the things that bring us pleasure and not to deny ourselves of that because of the work that we do also. Not to deny ourselves. So I'd like to end there. I think that's a beautiful way to end and just really, really lifting up the deep, deep appreciation for the four of you offering your wisdom and the grace and, and, you know, this conversation could go on for a few more hours. I'm sure of it. There's so much, so much more to say, um, but unfortunately we're at time and um if anyone in the audience um, has questions, you are welcome to follow up individually with me or I can connect, uh, or our team can connect you to um, any of the panelists individually for information or, or just to connect 